Alright, now that we've dealt with standing wave and resonance, we can apply that understanding to explain many different types of musical instruments. As you can see this orchestra in front of you, uh, we can actually explain a good 80-90% of these instruments just using our 1D standing wave. The drums and the percussion in the back, that's, that's not going to quite work, but the strings section you see here, that's all basically waves on the string that you've analyzed through your lab. Back here you have your flute, your saxophone, your, sorry, your French horn and other brass instruments and woodwind. Those are all air columns, which is going to be our next lab. But at the same time, they are just going to be roughly can be modeled as also a 1D air column, so therefore a 1D standing wave. First, when we talk about music, we're going to be dealing with different mediums. So I'm just going to remind you what happens when your vibration is across, moving across different mediums. So in this case, I have like a thicker blue rope on this side and attached to a lighter orange rope on the other side. We're not going to care so much about the reflection, but what I want you to see is, sure, on this side, because the rope is lighter, your wave speeds or your phase speed is going to be higher and so your wavelength gets longer but the amount of time it takes for one hump to move across on this side is the same as the amount of time it takes to create one wave on the transmitted side so that's why as the wave moves through the wavelength can change but the frequency stays the same so across different medium whenever you deal with more than one media, um, the frequency is going to be staying the same. It's the wavelength that change. So in terms of talking about sound, an instrument, we're moving through many different types of medium. We have vibration on the string or whatever instrument you have that gets amplified and transmit through the air, which then vibrates our eardrum, that vibrates the different bones in your middle ear, and then the fluid in your cochlea, and then the little here inside cochlea that's gonna ultimately create the nerve signal to your brain. So through all these different medium, the only thing that is preserved is the frequency. So that's why it makes the most sense to talk about sound in terms of frequency. So with these frequency, um, you notice sound frequency would be usually in the range of hundreds or thousands of hertz. That's the human hearing range is from like 20-ish hertz all the way up to maybe 20,000 hertz if you're really young and not an geezer like me. Very rarely do we shake an instrument at that speed. Our hands aren't that fast or our lungs are not going to be able to change the modulation of the air that quickly. We're, we don't make sound by breathing in and out hundreds of times a second. We don't create music by shaking the string at hundreds of hertz a second as well. That's why there's usually some kind of frequency selection mechanism, i.e. resonance, that happens in our musical instrument, and that's usually done through creating standing waves. And so that's kind of the central part of most musical instruments. It's this frequency selection where we can select certain frequency, therefore certain pitches and tones and notes that we play. And that's often done through, again, resonance and standing waves. So before that, another important part is the excitation. You have to kind of put energy into the instrument so it can start to vibrate. And this excitation usually hits all different frequency. So it could be something like a constant air pressure that you're applying through your lung, or just a plucking the string on a guitar or rubbing strings using friction to get the string vibrating this excites all the different frequency which then gets selected through the standing wave resonance mechanism and then finally we need to amplify this sound and this amplification once again happens at many frequencies so that when you play different notes the same amplification mechanism device still works and that's kind of the three key parts of musical instruments. You need something to excite it, something to select the frequency, and then some kind of amplification. Put them more concretely, say for cello. 
for instance. You still have these three parts. The first part, the excitation, is when you rub the bow on the string, that's going to start the whole string vibrating at all kinds of frequencies. Now only certain of those frequencies survives because you have um, standing wave on the string. You've analyzed that extensively depending on the tension and the length you can select certain frequencies and then finally the amplification is done through the body of the cello which is basically a big box of air which then creates allows you to vibrate a lot more air than otherwise so you can project your music a lot better so i will refer you to the next video it's a link to a great little project that i discover online but you can hopefully see how just by focusing on these three basic parts, we can still create an instrument that's very similar to a conventional one.